Welcome to the Wilderness Season Podcast. I'm your host, Sherry Ward. I have a passion to bring hope and breakthrough to those experiencing the toughest times of their lives. In this podcast, we will give you critical insights and revelations as I interview people just like you, those who have been right where you are and understand exactly what a wilderness season is all about. It's real, it's raw, it's practical. Come join the conversation. Welcome to the Wilderness Season Podcast. Hello and welcome back to the Wilderness Season Podcast. I am so excited to have Rob back with us again to talk about all of these different parts to the wilderness season. And you bring such a rich just depth to you that comes across in your stories and and the insights and revelation that God has given you. So thank you so much for being on the show again. And today we're going to be talking about contradictions, Yeah, contradictions of your promise so that when God gives us a promise and it just seems like it completely went 180 in the other direction. So I'm sure. Which it will. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Which it will. And I think you have a lot of things to share with that. So I want to open up and just talk about biblically and like some of the old time characters Mm -hmm. and stuff of the Bible and their contradictions. Because I always like to start there because I think it gives us a foundation for where we're going. And I know you love Abraham. So, you know, it says he believed against all hope. So he must have had some kind of contradiction. Yeah. And, you know, up to this point, we've been talking a lot about Abraham and Joseph. Maybe I'll take a, a going off a dif- different tangent and talk about David. Okay, love David too. Um, I'm going to start with a, a, a story of uh, one of my experiences in the wilderness, where when I was in a season of contradiction, where God had given me a promise, a promise that He seemed to confirm on several occasions. Um, prior to this experience, I heard three different sermons in one week. Um, Three different pastors with no idea that the other two pastors were preaching the exact same message. All three said almost word by word the exact same thing. Wow. And what they said was this. God will give you a promise, and then he will take you about as far in the opposite direction as he can possibly take you first. Now, we clearly see that in the story of Joseph. We see that in the story of Abraham. You know, in fact, yeah. he waited out 15 years. Bless his heart. I mean, can you really fault him for producing an Ishmael? Yeah. Um, but, you know, we clearly see that God did not fulfill it the next day. But let's take a moment and look at the story of David. You know, uh, Samuel came to David's household, prophesied that David would be the future king. And, he, and, and David takes out Goliath. And yeah. it's kind of like Joseph uh, interpreting the cupbearer's dream. Yeah. You're like, this is the way this of the is palace. It. Woohoo, we're there, yeah. And it was. It took him into the palace. He became uh, Saul's musician, so to speak, and he found favor with Saul. And had a top 10 album hit. <laughs> <laughs> Back in the day, I'm sure. So to some degree, it's like I've made it, and yet it wasn't at all the promised land because Saul was jealous of him. Saul wanted to kill him. David spent 10 years hiding in caves. And so this idea that God will give us a promise and take us as far in the opposite direction as he can possibly take us has quite a bit of biblical precedence. I think so. But the the key then that we're going to talk about is the why. Because it's, we, I know our last episode mm-hmm. was all about trust. Yeah. And so why is that? Why doesn't he just go, you know, hey, you're going to get ice cream and you're going to have it tonight for dinner. You know, it, it just doesn't happen that way. So yeah. we need to dive into the why a little bit of why. And maybe we're roaming in Wyoming again you know, <laughs> with the whys. <laughs> for those who haven't heard the last episode. Of but I should add, it. that's different than saying, God, why did you do this or why did you say that? This is more just kind of understanding what is God doing in the wilderness. It's not necessarily going to get me through, but the wilderness is, to a good degree, learning the character of God, who he is, and why he does the things that he does. Not the same as trying to solve the Rubik's Cube and get our way out. (laughs) Two different things. So why do you think he totally takes us in a 180 on the other, you know, completely the opposite of what he 
what he originally promised. Yeah. Yeah, Scripture says the word of God tested Joseph. And I think you, you could easily misinterpret what that means. Because when we think of a test, we think of, oh, i got to take a test and make a pass. But um, I believe the, the biblical understanding, the biblical definition of the word test there means more like refined in the fire. Like God is forging in us mm, that's good. what he needs to build in us. It's a lot more um, a passive, I don't want to say passive because we're working in collaboration with him. But to a good degree, we don't even understand what he's doing. It's not right, like right. passing a test. It's going on a journey. And like you said in the last podcast, just keep going. He's, he's inputting the data he needs to input. He is rewiring the system. He is burning in us the qualities that he needs to burn in us. We just don't often understand what he's doing. I think he also builds in us the capacity to handle what's coming. Yeah. Like he knows where he wants to take us in the promised land. And we have to build that, the systems and the capacity within us to sustain. And, you know, I've always said this, it's not just taking the promised land, but it's occupying the territory. Yeah. It's not just taking territory, but you got to occupy it. And so you've got to have all the goods. And there's even that scripture that says they, they conquered it in stages and degrees so that the wild animals went and take it over. Yeah. And one of my favorite stories that I've heard, I don't, I'm going to be honest, I don't know if it's true, but I heard this, is that whenever Oprah would make anything her favorite thing, like Oprah's favorite book or Oprah's favorite you know, item or music or whatever, her team would always go out and evaluate that company to see if they could handle the growth that was about to hit them. Mm -hmm. Because once she put her stamp on something, that company would just take off. But if yeah. they didn't have the systems in place, if they didn't have that capacity for the blessing that was about to hit, they would go under. Like it yeah. would be the opposite and it would go under. So I feel like part of the wilderness is building that capacity within us so that when we come out and come into the promised land, we can sustain the growth that's about to hit. And in that sustaining the growth is in its essence, in its entirety, a matter of trust like when we talk about giants in the land you know you can get the idea that oh my god this is this is such a huge mountain to remove but you know when we talk about spiritual things things are not often what they appear I'll, I'll give you an example um, Sean Bowles um, is the um, has been the associate pastor to my church expression 58 for seven eight years that i've been there and he is a highly prophetic individual um i mean this guy is able to call people out in a crowd and just read their mail i've seen it in action yeah and um, if i remember right he had an opportunity many years back where he met an individual and prophesied that this person would become pr the president of South Korea. Now, I want you to think about this. I mean, it's not like you need to go on a nine-month journey to defeat this giant. He is in a moment of time. He's in a Kairos moment where God has given him a word for an individual. And it's like, this is crazy. Yeah. I mean, if, if I'm wrong, yeah. <laughs> you know, telling this person he's going to be president of the United States, I could totally derail him and take him on a completely wrong direction of his life that will right. lead him to all this disappointment god this better be you i better be You're able right. to trust yeah. that this is you giving me this word right and it, you know it, it, i'm pretty sure i'm telling the story right i'm 95 percent sure i am but i can't be a fan of honest but if i i remember um this person did become the president of south korea and so god is preparing us for things where we would have not have capitalized in the past. You know, if God gave me a word today to tell someone, you're going to be a president of a nation. Yeah. I'm going to tell you flat out, I w I'm not ready to deliver that word. I don't have enough confidence oh, in good. my prophetic gifting yeah. to deliver yeah. that word. Now, right. there's other giants I can take down now. That you couldn't take down before. But that now I you couldn't can. take down before. Right. 
But the point being, when we think of giants in the land, sometimes we get the idea that we have to go through this long journey of all these trials and tribulations, and sometimes it's nothing more than a kairos moment in time where God prepares us to speak a word. And that word can transform a person's life. It can transform a community. It is a word that has the power to do tremendous, you know, mountain moving things. But do we trust God enough to speak it? And I always come back to this, and I, I'm, I'm probably a broken record in doing this, but, you know, the whole thing with the wilderness is Midbar. It's all about your words and what you say and and finding voice. And for me, a lot of it was finding voice and now knowing that authority in what I say and what I do. And like you said, sometimes I'm like, okay, I'm going for it, you know, on a bigger level than I have before. And then there's some things that I still have to reach for as well. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really, really good. I know also, too, that I feel like he gives us glimpses into our future. Like part of the contradiction is you feel like almost you're in the promised land or he gives us a younger version of ourselves glimpses into what's coming. Yeah. And then we go into the wilderness. Mm -hmm. I know for me, you know, I ran a teen pregnancy prevention program at Southgate High for a lot of years. And, you know, the media went crazy. You know, we were the media's darlings for a long time. You know, we were on Good Morning America, the Home and Family Show, like Japan TV, you name it. Like we were just out there and I got this glimpse of where I felt like God was eventually going to take me. And then all of a sudden I'm on the backside of the wilderness. It's like, what? Like what happened? Like it's a contradiction of, hey, I'm thinking that it's going this way, and it completely went yeah. the other way. And I feel like, you know, a lot of times we have those experiences where we kind of get glimmers of yeah. kind of that, of what it, where we're headed, and mm -hmm. then we go into the wilderness, and it seems like a 180 on everything. Yeah, I, I may be getting off track here, but you made me think of um, one experience I had in the wilderness you know, I didn't I didn't become a Christian until I was 23, but I remember watching uh, Was it Rocky four or Rocky faces Ivan Drago? <laughs> I was a huge Rocky fan. Saw all uh, seven movies like Rocky twice. Rocky was my favorite <laughs> uh, I loved all of them. I loved all of them and I think I was like 12 at the time I just remember after watching the movie I was so pumped. I'm in the parking lot. I'm doing these jabs, you know, I'm fighting this invisible Ivan Drago, you know. And, and some guy, you know, turns the corner and he sees me. I feel all embarrassed. But there was something about the Rocky character that I really identified with. Like this character who could get the living snot beat out of him and just keep going. And towards the tail end of, of my wilderness season I don't even remember how this happened but but that came back to me that memory came back to me and I realized that even all the way back then you know 10 years before I even became a Christian 10 years before I had any conscious thoughts about God at all God was still planting seeds preparing me for what was ahead oh interesting that's interesting. like he was forging a sense of identity that I would need in the future so it's like you got that glimpse. Wow. And so in that moment of time, that memory came back to me, and it, it, it gave me greater perspective. Great, it gave me a greater sense of divine identity that gave me a greater sense of strength to endure. That's great. So it's almost like he gives that to you as a vision and as an encouragement and a hope while you're on the backside of the desert, so to speak. And I, I think it's Rocky Three, and since you love Rocky, you're going to know which one it is. <laughs> yeah. But my favorite one is when he's getting the crud beat out of him by one of the guys. Yeah. It might have been Apollo Creed. Apollo Creed. Creed yeah. Probably. That's number Rocky three. three. And he's just like. Or Mr. T. I think he's yeah, Mr. One, T. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> one of those. But he keeps going, is that all you got? Yeah. Is that all you got? Is yeah. that all you got? And he's just getting the crud beat out of him, and you're like, I'm like, yes, just that inner, like. You know, that tenacity and that fortitude that yeah. he's got. And he's just he's just getting beat up and hammered. But but there's something inside of him in being hammered 
yeah. that rises up in him that I feel was already there, mm -hmm. but it got activated yeah. in the wilderness, so to speak. And that hard fight, something inside of him kind of snapped mm -hmm. and he got activated. Yeah. And I always like to say it's like a glow stick. How does a glow stick get activated? You break it in half and shake it. Mm -hmm. And you get broken and you get all that stuff shaken off of you. And then that light appears. You know, it's like that something inside of him in that fight just that was already there. It just rose yeah. up. I don't know if that makes any sense. But so, so to come full circle, you know, this idea of contradiction in the wilderness. What those experiences do is it is like a replacement mentality where the contradictions the contradictions test us to the core and we cannot lean on our old identities we cannot lean on our own natural identities Th those aren't strong enough to get us through we have to lean on the identification that god himself has burned into us. Into us, yeah. Like I'll give you another example. So my my biggest uh, examples of contradiction related to the promise of relationship or marriage. And I, <laughs> you know, I had the experience where God initiated a relationship. Like it was so divine. And it was so I obvious. Mean, <laughs> you could spend an hour trying to tell me, I don't really think that was God. I'm like, no, trust me, it was yeah. God. I mean, it was... <laughs> All the stars were in alignment. If I've ever seen God move, it was that. And not just yeah. because she was pretty or you were going after it, but all this, these words. Oh, and... no, it was so divine. It does. You talk about, you know, footprints in the sand. I mean, it's just <laughs> footprints everywhere. Yeah. And uh, he continued to, to confirm it, you know, and, and, and I was convinced. But at the same time, the contradiction was there were, there were holes in this relational dynamic. And I'm like, I don't think this thing will hold. And then I get another confirmation and another. Well, you know, we, we finally broke up um, after about four months of dating because I recognized there was something that she needed to process through, process through, and it just she had to kind of get away and like we couldn't do this in the dynamic of relationship. Mm -hmm. I had to let go and trust God for her to process what she needed to process. Mm -hmm. Well, nine months later, she married him. <laughs> another person wow so you talk about contradiction yeah you could like, say well God. god's not done yet no god's pretty much done that, that, you can seal the book on that one that if there is ever a contradiction that's it so what what do you do with that i mean you you can't reason yourself out of that but but there was um something god spoke to me during the nine months in between our last date and, and, and that experience where she got married and he said to me this world is not worthy of you now I almost hate hmm. saying that because it's I've actually only shared that with maybe two or three people before this well, good luck I, on that one I, now it's going out I'll... <laughs> I only say this because this is for people in the wilderness and when, when I heard that, I mean, at the moment, that was a me word. But, but afterwards, it became very clear. God's like, no, this, this is a word for people in the wilderness. The only people I share this with are people who really needed to hear it. Okay, so you're going to have to unpack that. So the words were, this world is not worthy of you. In other words, all my life, I've had this dynamic of... It just, it, it seems like I, I have gotten rejected again and again and again. Like this relationship dynamic has been the thorn in my flesh. Paul talks about this thorn in my flesh, this messenger of Satan to torment me. I mean, this has been mine my whole life. Mm -hmm. But when he said that to me, it rebranded me. Because he was saying, this is the truth of who you are. Like you see from the perspective, all my life I've been rejected. Mm -hmm. But from heaven's perspective, this world is not worthy of you. Mm, interesting. So then I go, well, are you, you know, keeping me? Do you have like a mystical bubble yeah. around me where you <laughs> prevent all these relationships? Uh, yeah, I don't know. But the, but the point is this. God is saying you can choose to identify yourself by a natural identity 
based off your experiences. Mm -hmm. Or you can choose to take the identity that I am now branding you with. Oh, this is how good. heaven sees you. That's so good. This world is not worthy of you. And that's what God wants to communicate to his people in the wilderness. That is ultimately what he wants to brand in you in the wilderness. Your natural identities limited you. They kept you in fear. They kept you in anxiety. They kept you in a sense of lack or this orphan poverty spirit. And he's saying, this is how heaven sees you. This is how I created you to be. You are seated in heavenly places with Christ. You are mine. Oh, that's good. I like the word that you use, rebranding. I like that a lot. I think that's that's a good phrase there, the, the rebranding. And I know for me, it, it, you know, the thing in the Christian community is everybody wants to, to do a class or a master class or coaching on identity. Mm -hmm. And it's so overused, you know, what identity really is. But right. I think going through the wilderness and facing the contradiction I feel like for me, even as as soon as like six months ago, or as you know, as recent as six months ago, I feel like the coin just dropped all of a sudden, mm -hmm. and it's like I started to see the authority that I carried and the things that he had forged or branded in me yeah. started coming out, and it, it almost was like a surprise, you know, like I'd pray and the other person would start crying and get Holy Spirit bumps or whatever it was. I'm like, whoa, what was that? I just feel like I kind of crossed over. Or there was something that the coin had just dropped after all these years. And it's like, really? Mm. Really? It took me that long to like figure this out or not figure it out, but, you know, get yeah. to this point. Yeah, there's no doubt. I, I feel the same way that, you know, there are teachings on identity, but the wilderness is all about God forging in you what you can't forge in yourself. You can't like, go read a class or do a book. Or <laughs> I, I have literally written out hundreds of scripture cards. Memorizing scripture, meditating on scripture. I, I've done all that. I mean, I could write the master's course on renewing the mind. But there's something that happens in the wilderness that is, is deeper. There is a deeper level of identity that is forged and God taking you on a journey. So I'll give you another example. There was one time where I was just having an amazing day with God. And like I said, most of these experiences happen shortly after a time of real darkness where I'm like, game over, I hate this, <laughs> I'm done. And then I'll have this just an amazing day or an amazing revelation, revelation or yeah. series of revelations yeah. or God will open a door and... and, and the common theme is God winking, saying, I'm still on the throne. Yeah. But I had this one experience where I'm, I'm walking through the park, and it's just hours of just just an amazing time alone with God, just me and God the whole day. And I'm walking through the same park that I'd walk through every evening, and I'm completely oblivious to my circumstances around me. And just caught up in the... Um, the epiphany, the, the understanding that God really is the author and perfecter of my faith, that he really is taking me on this amazing journey of, of realization and, and all his thoughts and ideas come to me. And I'm caught up in this and I'm like, God, do you really love me this much? And literally, just as the words are coming out of my mouth, suddenly my ears note the song of the church group singing in the park. And they're singing... Nails in your hands. Oh, I like that song. Nails in your feet. They tell me how much you, you love, love me. And I'm just <laughs> bawling. Oh, my God. You totally, you planned it. It's like the timing of me walking through the park saying this. And, yeah, and, and yeah. experiences like that, you so see God's sovereign lordship over your life. It, that's what I mean by burning identity into you. I totally can relate. I I was kind of in a down moment with all the promises and stuff, and it just didn't seem like it was going anywhere. And I went to the grocery store. And of all places, you know, I'm in the parking lot of a grocery store, and I get a random phone call. And the phone call 
I think it's maybe like a telemarketer because I don't recognize the phone number. And I'm I'm just going to confess I'm really bad with telemarketers. It's like, sorry, click buy, uh, you know. So I'm ready to do the click yeah, buy so thing, what? you know. And, and for some reason, I stayed on the phone with this guy. And he goes, I don't know who you are, but the Holy Spirit told me to call this phone number and give you this prophetic word. Mm. And out flows his mouth like, I see you in a really deserty area. <laughs> and like, mm. I mean, he just totally nailed like the wilderness. A telemarketer. Wow. Yeah. And he okay. wasn't a telemarketer. He was some random oh, guy okay. that the Holy Spirit said, oh, wow. call this phone number. Huh. So I'm like bawling. I'm sitting at in the grocery store parking lot on the curb, just sitting down listening to him just bawling in the mm. parking lot as he's reading my mail. Yeah. And telling me, like, what kind of season I'm in, which he completely nailed the wilderness, and then proceeds to tell me all the promises. Mm. And I knew it was like, you call it a wink, but I knew that it was God just saying, I got you, babe. I got you. I hear you. I mean, some random guy. So I immediately ran back in the car and wrote down as much as I could remember because I wanted to always remember that moment because it was like that wink from God just saying, I see you. I hear you. I get you. And I love how, like you said, you set it out of your mouth. And before it even, like, finished coming out, I've had so many yeah. of those. So many and of you're, those. you're like, wow, God actually orchestrated this event. And he knew I was going to ask him at that exact moment. Oh, man, I'm trying to think of the name of the movie. There is this movie. Can you pause it for a second? Oh, what? There's this movie called August Rush. Have you seen that movie? It's been a long time ago. I have, but it's been a long time. Um, this was one of the movies I saw during my wilderness season. And just wept like crazy. Because it is... So for those of you who are listening, I highly recommend this movie. But it's, it's basically about a movie of this guy and this woman who meet, they fall in love, they have a child, and then they have this s- separation of untimely circumstances this contradiction so to speak where you know god seems to do this divine you know uh, bringing together two people and then it's just completely dismantled and they go their separate ways and then they don't see each other they don't hear of each other for years and the movie ends with such a stunning both a visual and a musical compilation of divine convergence of God bringing things together at just the right time. You know, it's kind of like I shared that experience my 40th day oh, of yeah, laying down that. my yeah. Isaac and I'm reading through the 40th chapter yeah. of the book I wrote about Jesus, 40th day in the wilderness. And I look down and I'm like, I'm like, I feel like Moses with the burning bush where God says, Moses, take off your sandals for the place you're sitting is holy ground and I look down and I'm wearing sandals and I never <laughs> Lost ever it. ever wear sandals I'm like oh my god the divine convergence that's amazing yes that's so good I I want to um, change subjects a little bit on this um, I feel like while we're in that contradiction the enemy knows how to go after us yeah. and I think you say that again that one saying that I really love about he hits you in your deepest wound What's that yeah. saying? Because then I'm going to tell. I was saying when God like gave a... the promise to Abram and Sarah, God met them at the place of their greatest wound. Their okay. greatest wound was they were two senior citizens who were barren. Right. But it's that greatest wound part for me and my husband was trying to make the mortgage on our house. You know, yeah. especially when we did the remodel and we kind of overextended and trying to. Um, make that mortgage was really tough and i think one of the fears we had was we're going to lose the house so Mm -hmm. that was one of the fears so i feel like the enemy knows that and the enemy can go directly at that so i have a really wild story Mm -hmm. and that's my husband's a fireman and so somebody randomly took his picture at the firehouse one time in full uniform yeah they put it up on on a stock footage website that somebody grabbed and put it on to put him on the front of the pamphlet. Mm. Now, what are the odds 
that we would even ever see this pamphlet. I mean, right. how many graphic <laughs> artists like pick Statistically pictures? Statistically speaking, pretty, and, pretty and, slim. and what are the odds that it would say something that would directly impact that wound? Mm. So one of his friends goes to Oregon. Now, we live in Southern California. Okay, we're not even close to Oregon. Goes to Oregon, walks in a real estate office, and there is my husband's picture on this pamphlet. And the, on the cover of the pamphlet, it says, he can save many lives, but he can't save his own home. Oh, God. <laughs> okay, number one, how would that even happen that they would write those exact uh -huh. words when we were struggling with that? And how would we even have seen it and known about it? He actually brought the pamphlet home. And I feel like the enemy in those contradictions will go after the, you know, will sucker punch us mm -hmm. in that place that is our deepest wound. And that yeah. for us was like a sucker punch to us. Yeah, the story, uh, the Disney movie, Joseph, Prince of Dreams, does a good job at depicting this. You know, where if you remember, Joseph was the product of Rachel, and Rachel only had a child until her sister Leah and her two concubines had given um, um, Isaac or, or Jacob uh, ten sons first. Right. So she so, was at the back of the bus <laughs> on that one. <laughs> or, or nine sons. She was number. Joseph was number ten. So when Joseph came. You know, it was such a miracle for um, for Jacob and Rachel yeah. that they, at least the movie depicts, that he had kind of a special relationship. And the other brothers were jealous of Joseph because he was the promised child, so to speak. Right, right. And so the movie depicts this idea that, you know, he just wanted to fit in. Like, I just want to be like my brothers. I'm, I, 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 I just don't want to be the outcast who they're, they all separate from because they're jealous because I have this identification like I'm the promised child. And so God gives him these dreams that his, the, his brothers and even his own parents would bow down to him. Mm -hmm. In a sense, it's like taking his greatest wound and going, but one day they will bow down. He's like, oh my God, that's what I've always wanted and so much more, you know. And, and then he has another dream of the sun, the moon, and the stars bowing down to him. Which is even more. Uh, even, yeah. yeah, talk about, uh, um, you know, wow. piping your ego. And then what happens next? Instead of his brothers going, oh my God, Joseph, you're so special. We love you. You're amazing. <laughs> wow. Yes, we do bow down to you. We worship the amazing person. That No, they betray him and they sell him into slavery. So the total opposite and the contradiction. The complete yeah. Yeah. opposite happens instead. Yeah. And then, uh, again, all of these stories have a common thread. They all had to forgive people in the end. So I think that yeah. forgiveness piece is so important. And... For me, I had to be honest. I was angry with God, and I don't think I was honest with that for a long time. I was disappointed in him. I, anger is kind of a secondary emotion, so I think the first emotion was more disappointed. Yeah. God, you said this, and this didn't happen. God, you said this, and this didn't happen. Yeah. And just having to forgive God, and I know that's weird theology, mm -hmm. but but <laughs> knowing that I had to just forgive what I couldn't understand. Yeah, I and mean, I think when we're real with ourselves, when we really dig, we have more unforgiveness towards God than any other human being. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Because we place him as like the one who sits enthroned over all of it, who had the ability to change A, B, and C. And didn't. didn't. Yeah. And yeah. that's tough. That's a tough pill to swallow. Yeah. But I think it's really important at, in our wilderness journey that we forgive. Yeah, and, and again, the reason why that's so central is because at the point of the wound, it's, it's a matter of identification. Like, this person destroyed my life. And, and then in the wilderness, God's like, no, no human being can destroy your life. Because it's no longer you who live, it's Christ who lives in me. In other words, your bondage is your identification with your natural state. Yeah. 
You know, yeah. I have these giftings and these are my weaknesses. I've had these successes. I've had these failures. I, you know, and, and we, we identify ourselves with a, a limited identification that always keeps us lacking and anxious for something to complete us. Mm -hmm. But it's in the place of coming to full forgiveness that we are releasing our natural identification with that person's ability to destroy us and replacing it with God's spiritual identification, which is I'm the author and finisher of your faith, this, this has no ability to derail my greater purposes and who I have called you to be. And I think that's important to know that even though God maybe didn't shift the circumstances, that we need to shift our own narrative of it. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the wilderness is shifting your narrative. Like what narrative are we telling ourselves about this? Yeah. Are we falling in victim? Are we falling in... You know, all of these places, disappointment means, God, you weren't there. And so we have to switch that narrative. We may not understand why you didn't show up the way that I thought you were going to show up, but you've got the bigger picture in mind. And I love this new season that I'm personally in where he's, he's putting a big, fat red bow on everything. Not mm. every single thing, but the major pieces. And, and now looking back, I can see. And I think when we read the Bible, that's so much how we read it because it's like, oh, Joseph, yeah, this, this, this thing happened in the dream. And then he went in the yeah. wilderness and all this stuff. And then, and then we already know the happy ending, but when it's our own story. <laughs> and it's amazing. We don't it know the ending. It only takes you 10, 15 minutes to get to the happy yeah. ending yeah, as yeah, opposed yeah. to 10, 15 years. Yeah. But we don't see the happy ending to our own story because it hasn't been right. played out yet. Yeah. You know, there's a scripture that says, these things have happened so that your faith, which is of greater worth than gold, refined in the fire, shall be proved genuine. I don't remember how the scripture ends. But just think of it from an eternal perspective. Again, last video, I, I said, let's take a step back and look at this from an eternal perspective. The essence of the testing of our faith is the, the question, the crux, is God good? God allows trials for the refining of our faith. That is the ultimate question, whether it's can I trust him? Is God going to finish the good work that he began? You know, can I trust that you'll never leave me nor for forsake me? It's all rooted in the basic essence, is God good? Because if God is good, the answer is no, he will never leave me. Yes, he will finish the good work they began. Yes, he is faithful. That answers all the other questions. But again, when we take a step back and we look from an eternal perspective, God gives us the promise of eternal life. But we have to wait 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years for this reality that's so great we can't even comprehend it. Mm -hmm. So our very existence from the day we first hear the call to salvation to the day we take our last breath is one giant crucible of do you trust that I'm good? So that in the end, he can fully realize this goodness that is far beyond anything we could have ever even imagined. Yeah, that's well said. I like that. I, I fully agree with that. All right, so wrapping it up today, this was another fantastic and rich conversation about contradictions in our wilderness and the promises that we had. Do you have any other stories or anything else you want to add to that, wrapping that up today? You know, I just wanted to share a story, a parable, so to speak, to kind of put this in perspective, to give us an illustration. If you are in that crossroads where you're like, God, none of this makes any sense at all. Which like, is everybody. <laughs> which is, to some degree, all of us. Yeah. It's like either God is a liar or I've been deceived, in which case can I really trust that he's able to lead me? In which case, is he really the good shepherd? It's like, we've all been in this catch-22 where I'm like, I don't understand God. This oh, does not make sense. So I'm going to give you a, a short story to kind of illustrate our role to play in that. Uh, for many years as a sixth grade teacher, I, I read this story, this picture book of uh, the naturalist John Muir. 
Mm-hmm. And there is a story when he went off on this grand adventure with his dog, Skippine. And uh, <laughs> there was this huge uh, snowstorm that came unexpected. And he reached this point where he realized, if I try to wait out this storm, I'm going to freeze to death. I'm not going to make it. Yeah. But if I turn back, it's too long a journey. I'm also going to freeze to death. I'm not going to make it. There's only one way I'm going to survive. I have to move forward to get back to the camp. Mm -hmm. But here's the problem. The path forward is this very narrow ice bridge, this very high ice bridge. If I fall, I die ice bridge. (laughs) I'm seeing the the metaphor now. (laughs) And he's stuck with this reality that there's only one way but it is the path of greatest risk. The ice bridge is the choice to trust God even when nothing makes sense. See, we think if we could crack the code, if I can somehow figure out what God's doing in this, put all the pieces of the puzzle together, I finally solved the puzzle, then we can find our way out. No, that's no, not the way out. it's not. It's completely The way out is a choice, and it's a choice we have to keep making every day. God, I don't understand, but I stand on what I know is true. And your character. Your word, the confession of your character is that solid foundation. When the storms come, why am I not destroyed in it? Because, Lord... I choose to anchor, I choose to trust against all hope that you are good, you are the author and perfecter of our faith, and you are going to finish the good work you've begun. That is a fantastic analogy. I love that metaphor. And I love when Peter, in in the Bible, he says, I have nowhere else to go. Where am I else am I going to go but with you? Right. And there's so many times in the wilderness when I would say, I have no place to go except forward. I I can't, I'm too far into this rabbit trail to turn back now. Like I can't, there's not even a possibility I can turn around because I'm so far deep into this. Right. That, and that's at the end, I felt like that's what God kept saying is just keep going, just keep going, just keep going. It was like, he was just scooting me along, you know, to keep going when I was afraid to take that next step. And, you know, whatever was coming next, he's like, just keep going. And again, I want to hammer home this point. There might be listeners who are in that dark hour like, I can't even go another day. (laughs) I can't make it. Just remember, God's grace is new every morning. I can't tell you how many experiences I had where I'm like, game over, it's done. Yeah. And then God comes in in a new way. And you're like, God, you were amazing. And, and you're all and crying. It's like, oh, God. He knows how to sustain you. And even if yeah. you are like, it's, you don't understand. It's been days. It's been weeks. Or years. The sun will rise again. But, I mean, if it's been years, I'm sure you've had some good days in between. But he knows how to sustain you. You may say, I can't go on. And he's smiling saying, yeah, trust me. You can I know how to get you through. There's yeah. still sunny days ahead. You're, you're going to be fine. That's so awesome. And I really like, I think it's very important not to look back at our prior history to gauge for what we're about to do. Mm-hmm. Um, because God, what God has in store for you is yet to be manifested. So we can't look back and at the prior history mm-hmm. and try to gauge that. Because what we're coming into, we've never come into before. And that's another element of the wilderness is, you know, Paul said, one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. ahead yeah. He also talked about running the race to win the crown, not a crown that, that um, you know, decays in this life, but a crown that is eternal. And so God is training us to be still in this mind that can become like a pinball machine. Trying to figure everything else. I got a to-do list of 12 things today, and this person is on my butt because I haven't done this. And it's just like, stop. Calm down. Breathe. Be still. Keep moving forward. Yeah. And that's what we want to leave you guys with today. And one of my favorite quotes from Charles Swindoll says, we are all faced with a series of great opportunities, brilliantly disguised as impossible situations. Mm -hmm. 
And that's one of my favorite sayings. And we want to just encourage you today, um, keep going, keep going. You may not know what your next step is. You may not know even what your next minute holds. At Sometimes it was just like minute by minute. But that grace is renewed, like Rob said, every day. And we want to encourage you to keep going. So until next time, we'll see you later from the Wilderness Season Podcast. Thank you for listening to the Wilderness Season Podcast. If you need help navigating through your own wilderness season, pick up a copy of my book, A Journey Out of the Wilderness, available on Amazon. Also, continue the conversation online with us by going to our Wilderness Season Facebook page. For resources and events, you can go to www.sherrylynnward.com. If you have enjoyed this show, please subscribe and review our podcasts. Just remember, you're not alone.